this is not good. Hey everyone, I'm Abby Sharp. Welcome to Abby's Kitchen. Today's video is sponsored by Built Bar and we'll be reviewing lifestyle YouTuber and new mom, Sam Ozkirill. But first let me tell you about my sponsor, Built Bar. So you guys know I'm saying it and I am saying it again. These bars are really, really, really tasty. And I don't usually like protein bars at all because I don't like chalk masquerading as a health food, but I love these bars. Like they taste like a chocolate bar, but they have protein in them. So yeah, winning. Today's little snack time pleasure, a little afternoon delight. Mm -hmm. Let's go tropical today. Wow, coconut. So 17 grams of protein, feeling it. tastes like the vacation that I am definitely not having this year. But this would be so good like on yogurt or in oatmeal, or sometimes what I like to do is melt it in the microwave for like 10 seconds. Mm. Put a little whipped cream on top. Oh my gosh, that is killer. Coconut whipped cream, next level. And I usually have one before bed, like every day. But if I were to do this as a post-workout snack, I would definitely want to pair it with some source of carbs like fruit, oats, toast, whatever. But if you want to check these out yourself, check out the link in my description and use my promo code ABBYSHARP15 for 15% off of your order. Now, before we get into it, feel free to pause the screen or look at the description to check out my disclaimer, including a trigger warning to those with current or previous experiences with disordered eating. So of course, feel free as always to skip this video if it's not supportive to your journey. And if you are new here, do not forget to subscribe to this channel and ring that little bell so that you do not ever miss out on a video, ever. Never, never, never. Be the first one here. I like to see it. Also note that I film these what I eat in a day videos well in advance. So this is not necessarily her most up-to-date diet or up-to-date display of what she eats. In fact, she actually posted a brand new one this morning right before we went to start taping. But we really want to focus in on her kind of postpartum belly tips and her gut health tips. So I really hope you enjoy this review. All right, let's get into it. One of the first things that's so important that I neglect, but it's such a simple thing, is warm lemon water. Have that first thing in the morning. You've just been sleeping, your body is dehydrated. Why go right to coffee? That's going to make it even worse. Okay, so let's debunk this for a hot minute. One, you guys know what I'm gonna say, but there is nothing magical about lemon water. It's water that's flavored with a little bit of vitamin C. So as much as any source of water can hydrate you and promote regularity, lemon water is of course good for your gut. Second, is coffee really dehydrating? No, not really. Yes, caffeine is a mild diuretic, which in theory would increase urination and cause you to lose more fluid. But it actually doesn't work like that because this isn't a caffeine pill. This is caffeine in water. So you're not likely to lose more fluid through urine than you're taking in by drinking the caffeinated drink. And I mean, it's even possible that the cup of coffee could potentially help hydrate you, not do the opposite. Now, is straight up lemon water better as a hydration option? Yes. Obviously. Yes, it is. But you don't need to obsess over which one you drink first in the name of hydration. Also, this isn't something she mentioned, but I want to take this time to bring up something that I get asked about a lot, which is regarding whether or not coffee first thing in the morning increases cortisol. 
So there are a lot of TikToks going around suggesting that you want to delay your morning cup until like mid morning when your cortisol levels are naturally a little bit lower so as not to exacerbate the stress response. But we actually have no evidence to support that suggestion. And more importantly, the cortisol boosting effects of coffee are hugely diminished if your body is accustomed to drinking it. So if you're having coffee every day, even if it is first thing in the morning on an empty stomach, you're unlikely seeing any huge dangerous effects on cortisol levels. So one of my friends turned me on to the seed probiotics is good for gut health is because it's going to add in good bacteria. The more backed up you get, the more bloated you'll feel, the more uncomfortable you'll feel, and it actually turns toxic in your body that you have to be going regulars. Okay, so a few things I wanna chat about with this. Now I have looked at this seed probiotic and I think it looks great. It's heavily tested, so that's a plus in my books. And yes, having a varied strong microbiome is really important for regularity and gut health. And this particular supplement not only has the probiotic, which is the bacteria, but it also is a prebiotic, which feeds the good bacteria a source of beneficial fiber. And as we know, fiber does help you poop. So yes, we like. Now, as for Sam's suggestion that the poop in your body turns toxic, there is this common myth that constipation causes the body to absorb poisonous substances in stools, leading to diseases like arthritis, asthma, and colon cancer. But there's no evidence that stools produce toxins or that colon cleansing or laxatives or enemas can prevent cancer or other diseases. Constipation itself is not considered a disease. It's a symptom. So if you are constipated, definitely speak to your doctor about some ways to determine the root cause rather than just trying to make yourself poop. Once we get back in, that's when I make my coffee. The new coconut and espresso pod is amazing. And then I add in collagen. Collagen actually repairs your gut lining. You should YouTube Dr. Axe and he talks all about the benefits of collagen with your gut health. And then I've been loving the Chobani sweet cream creamer. All right, so I'm gonna stick to my rule that coffee is free game in the world of my wedding day reviews, but I do wanna quickly talk about collagen. Uh, first of all, Dr. Axe is not a credible source of nutrition information. He makes a ton of unsubstantiated claims, including promoting frankincense for cancer, mushroom capsules for anxiety, and a bunch of other essential oils for Alzheimer's and dementia. And you cannot market products to treat, cure, or alleviate symptoms of diseases without FDA approval. And that, my friends, is not something that Dr. X has, or anyone else in this case. So yeah, not a fan. But anyways, everyone and their pseudo doctor seems to be adding collagen to their coffee these days. And while there is some early evidence suggesting that collagen supplements may help to improve skin health and joint health, when it comes to repairing gut lining or leaky gut, not so much. There's just no good scientific evidence to date to support this suggestion or even the diagnosis of leaky gut, but that's a whole other video in itself. Um, but in fact, some collagen supplements may even have a negative effect on digestion with some people, um, as some do report uncomfortable feelings of like fullness and heartburn. But even though taking collagen appears to be totally safe and benign for most people, you might as well save your money and get the same benefit from eating more vitamin C and protein containing foods or really any protein supplement on the market since these are the precursors to collagen production in the body. And when we're talking about gut health specifically, sticking to protein rich foods for your daily dose of collagen may even offer some additional benefits for your gut, especially when coming from probiotic containing protein sources like yogurt and kefir, as well as beans and legumes, which provide that happy gut fiber. Having warm meals throughout the day, cooked meals could be really helpful in healing on your gut. Okay, so interestingly, there is new animal research suggesting that cooked food may positively alter the gut microbiome and promote nutrient absorption better than, let's say, raw food. 
However, more research is definitely needed in this area, and it is still unclear how this research translates to the microbiome of a human. I also think that the recommendation to prioritize warm food for gut health may be rooted in Ayurvedic practices, which suggests that hot foods can improve digestion and circulation. However, in Ayurvedic practices, a hot food is not actually dependent on the temperature of the food. Rather, some foods are considered to be hot based on the supposed effect that it has on the body. So even something like ice cream could be considered a hot food because it's thought to induce heat in the body. You ain't got the answers, man! Confusing, I know. But either way, we really don't have enough good solid research to suggest that only eating warm foods makes any significant difference when it comes to digestion, as it mostly just depends on the type of food that you're eating more so than the specific temperature it's being served at. So for example, a warm pureed soup may be easier to digest compared to a warm cooked steak with roasted potatoes and veggies. So even though they might be the exact same temperature, they would actually be digested a bit differently because the soup is already partially pre-digested, which would therefore require a lot less work by the body. On the other hand, the very same soup may be more easily digested by one person than somebody else just based on their individual tolerance levels and their unique gut microbiome. But this is basically just my long, long, long winded way of saying that the temperature of foods really won't make a huge significant impact on your gut health compared to other more significant factors like food type and preparation methods. I like to make my snacks cute. We can portion control a lot better when we put it all out. Like if I were to just go sit on the couch with these, I would just eat the whole thing. You don't wanna eat a million times a day. And so when you stop eating and give yourself space and give yourself time to digest, your body can start to break down that food and it can also work on other things like cell turnover. People even like to do this for anti-aging benefit. How good does this look? So I have the peaches, cherries, crackers, burrata. So this snack screams summertime and I am here for it. We have a great hunger crushing combo with the crackers and fruit offering up some carbs along with the protein and fat from the burrata, which looks totally divine. I am low-key obsessed with burrata. I mean, I don't know if you've seen my Instagram stories, but burrata on toast is my new weekend obsession. I honestly can only afford to do it like once a week because it's like $13 a ball here, but oh my gosh, so worth it. As for portioning, if you are someone who tends to eat while distracted, it can be really easy to totally zone out of your fullness signals and find your way like to the bottom of the cracker box. So putting your snack in a bowl or a plate, or in this case, like a beautiful Instagrammable wooden platter, which feels hella unrealistic as a mom, uh, rather than just eating out of the box, is a really good tool to help you check in with your hunger. So that way, when you finish your portion and you check in with yourself and you determine that you're maybe still looking for more, you can easily add more to the bowl or plate. This to me isn't about restriction, it's about mindfulness and also about avoiding distraction when you eat. It just gives you those checkpoints to help yourself become more accountable and more in tune with your true needs. As for her thoughts on fasting or like avoiding grazing, while a 2018 review suggested that fasting may help to promote cell turnover, the majority of the research we have to date has been done on animals or in test tubes. So similar to the whole hot food, cold food debate, we really don't have a ton of great solid understanding of how this research translates into humans. Now, what I think that she may be referring to in this clip, but she doesn't say it, is what we call the migratory motor complex or MMC. Now I talked about the MMC briefly in my SIBO video right here, but in short, the migratory motor complex is kind of like a big broom that helps to sweep food particles through the digestive tract every 130 minutes or so. This is literally the most legit form of cleansing our body does, and you don't need green juice to make it happen. But basically over time, if we never give our body the opportunity to do this clean sweep, 
because we're putting little bites of food in our mouth all day as long as, as we tend to do when we're moms, um, bacteria can potentially pool there and it can affect the integrity of our microbiome. So if this is her rationale for trying to space out her meals and snacks every few hours, this does make good sense. Now, I also think it's worth reminding everyone that your body is extremely intelligent. If it needs more food, it will tell you. If it needs less food, it will tell you. If it needs rest, it will tell you. So if you constantly find yourself always need to be constantly snacking and grazing all day long because you're just not satisfied, it might be a good indicator that your meals need to be more balanced or that you just need to eat more food in that meal. And if you're trying to space your meals out, it's really worth collecting that data that, hey, you know, I need more food at that lunch meal or snack in order to make it to my next meal without getting ravenous and just putting everything in my mouth. That's what she said. Let's see what she's making. For lunch, I'm reheating this chicken soup that I made in my last video. Soup doesn't sound super summery, but it's great on your gut. And then my neighbor invited me over to pick some kale. So I added it in my soup. I got the idea from Gwyneth Paltrow's book. So yes and no to soup being good for your gut. Generally speaking, cooking your vegetables a la soup is gonna be a lot easier on digestion compared to eating them raw because those tough fibers are already somewhat broken down for you. And generally speaking, I would say that a chicken noodle soup is relatively easy on the gut. Unless of course you have a sensitive gut to certain FODMAPs, uh, since some of the big FODMAP triggers like garlic, onions, and celery are kind of the base of any chicken soup. She also added in some pretty big pieces of raw kale at the end there and didn't really give it any time to cook down and soften. So if she does have a sensitive tummy, I would at least cook down that kale or mince it up really, really fine into small pieces so that it cooks down faster in the heat. It's also worth noting that really brothy soups can easily tip the scales into being quite high in sodium, which can also lead to sodium retention and bloating. Now, this is not exactly the same bloating that you would experience if you had IBS, but it still could feel uncomfortable in the gut. But I do really like that we have some protein in the chicken, fiber and carbs in the noodles and veg, loving that right there. But I do think we could bump up the fat and calories generally. I mean, it is a very light meal here. So pairing this with like a piece or two of toast with some olive oil or some avocado on top would be a really nice way to bump that up. So I am grilling the zucchini with some garlic, add in the asparagus for the last three minutes. I did want to make a little salmon on the side because there was just no protein. Fresh oregano, a purple onion, and then I put my own twist on it by adding a little cherry tomatoes. Put it all in a bowl and you have the perfect summer salad. Primal Kitchen balsamic, which is a healthier, no sugar added. You can find this on Thrive Market. Mix it all in and I served it with salmon. Okay, so I have to agree with Sam. That looks like the most delicious, perfect summer salad. Uh, we've got some beautiful seasonal veggies in there like asparagus, zucchini, and cherry tomatoes. We've got some carbs from the pasta and some protein and healthy fats from the salmon. I mean, I really don't know how you could go wrong with this. Now, before we wrap things up with the stats and the recommendations, I want to take a quick look at Sam's postpartum weight loss strategy that I'm not eating for two. First trimester, you're eating the same. The second trimester, you want to increase it by a snack. Third trimester, you want to increase it by a meal. Pretty much stuck to that diet. I had ice cream sometimes. Some days we would just have pizza and then other days I'd be eating super clean. So it's not like I ate 100% clean 24 seven, but I was definitely 80, 20. Okay, so I like that Sam is poking a few holes in the whole eating for two myth because as she said, the caloric requirements during pregnancy is pretty much equivalent to adding like an extra snack in your second trimester and an extra meal in your third trimester. It's not exactly a situation where you've got to double your grocery bill. But ultimately, these are just suggestions and some people may find that they actually need more calories to feel satisfied. So it's really important to let your body be your guide. I also want to remind folks that while your pregnancy app might suggest that you're supposed to gain a perfect pound per week, 
In real life, it doesn't have to look like that. In my first pregnancy, I barely gained anything until like the last two months. And in my second pregnancy, I gained almost all of my weight in the first trimester and gained pretty much nothing in the last month. So every person and pregnancy is different. And I also think it's great that she tried to create some balance for herself by prioritizing nutrient dense foods to help support her baby, while also leaving some room in there for foods she just enjoys. However, I just gotta say, I'm obviously not a fan of verbiage like clean or 80-20. It's dated, it's boring, let's move on. The first is when I got home from the hospital, I did have a belly band and it also helps flush out the extra fluid. So it's great to hear that the belly band seemed to work for Sam. Uh, even though there is no real solid research supporting the use of belly bands postpartum, anecdotally, some women may find that they help to support their core muscles postpartum, as was the case for Sam. However, belly bands are still a kind of temporary fix. So I would still recommend that women who experience diastasis recti consult with their pelvic floor physiotherapist as you really want to focus on DR friendly exercises. As for her comment about it flushing out excess fluid, in case no one prepared you for this, expect to sweat a lot postpartum. I actually thought that I was dying after my first pregnancy because I was soaking my sheets every night. So this isn't so much likely to do with the belly band, it's just a shift in hormones and your body getting rid of the excess water that it held onto during pregnancy. But honestly, I also think it's a bit strange to me that she included this tip in her video on how she lost her postpartum belly because belly bands are not a weight loss tool. They are meant to support your core as a rehabilitation tool, not to magically de-bloat, cleanse, reshape, detoxify, or permanently whittle your waist. I did breastfeed. I'm actually still breastfeeding. I'm getting close to being done breastfeeding. We are in the weaning process, but a lot of people told me, oh yeah, that helps you lose weight. It helps you burn calories and all that. Yeah, I think there's a huge expectation that breastfeeding will automatically result in extreme weight loss postpartum. And that makes total sense when we consider that breastfeeding or pumping burns around 20 calories per ounce. However, in real life, breastfeeding doesn't result in weight loss for all women across the board. I actually have a whole blog post on this one, but some women like me may actually gain some weight from breastfeeding postpartum. So there's a number of potential reasons for this, like an increase in prolactin, which is the fat storing hormone, cortisol from lack of sleep and stress, and of course the increase in appetite resulting in eating more. Ultimately, despite what Aunt Karen says, the current evidence suggests that postpartum lifestyle factors like sleep and diet are likely much more indicative of weight loss outcomes than breastfeeding the fab four smoothie i found be well by kelly so the fab four smoothie is protein fat greens and fiber and you can just pick whatever you want to do protein powder almond butter greens non-dairy milk and flax seeds as my fiber all right so this is really a similar concept to my hunger crushing combo which is really just a way to balance your meals with protein fat and fiber rich carbs to help keep you full now, while you could totally use a source of carbs for fiber here by adding in some fruit, it looks like Sam is making her smoothie kind of like low carb by opting for some flaxseed instead. And I know she says that this tastes super good and hearty to her, but personally, I need fruit in my smoothie. But to each their own, if it works for her, it works for me. That if you must add fruit in your smoothie, she says just keep it to a fourth cup. When you start your day with a lot of sugar, it raises your insulin and you're just trying to keep up with that all day. So you have a smoothie and then you're hungry like an hour later, 30 minutes later. Ah, got it. Now we know the rationale for the fruitless smoothie and it's a bit of a swing and a mess. So the satiety factor of the Fab Four combo would still stand even if you threw a little fruit into the mix, which by the way, would also add satiating fiber. Not only that, but the carbs from the fruit would add a boost of energy and that would be sustained from the protein and the fat and the fiber content in the smoothie. In other words, 
Adding a little bit of fruit to your smoothie wouldn't spike your blood sugar levels like Sam suggests. Sure, it might not be a keto smoothie, but Sam isn't strictly keto anyways, and it really wouldn't break her weight loss goals either, seeing as a half cup of berries has just 24 calories. So yeah, this just seems like an unnecessarily restrictive rule to me. I started adding some low carb dinners into my diet. So I am 100% not low carb. However, I do add low carb lunches or low carb dinners. If I'm eating a lot of carbs, I notice that I have more water weight, I bloat more. I mean, I guess going semi low carb would also explain the fruitless smoothie. Even though again, half a cup of berries is generally allowed even on some modest keto diet. So I just feel like it's obnoxiously strict. But that bloating she mentioned is likely just a little extra water. And that's because when we store excess carbs as glycogen, we store them with about three to four times their weight in water. And this is why often when people go super low carb, they lose a lot of weight really fast. And this is just the initial loss in water storage, not necessarily fat. Regardless, if this way of eating feels best to Sam, it totally works for me. I'm just really glad that Sam doesn't seem to be 100% all in on the keto low carb life, especially because it's unclear whether or not ketosis is actually safe while breastfeeding. Early research on animals suggests that ketones do appear in breast milk and that breast milk from keto mom rodents was insufficient in nutrition, volume, or both resulting in growth retardation. Now this is rats, not humans, so please do not freak out. We still need a lot more research to determine the risk in humans like us. And also Sam isn't even keto, so I'm really not worried about the safety of her milk. But I just wanted to flag one of the many reasons why carbs and also getting enough calories more specifically can be important for our growing babes. Now aside from the water with the carbs causing bloating, it's also possible that some of the carbs she enjoys may be higher in FODMAPs, and therefore they may be causing some digestive distress. Now I've got a whole video on FODMAPs, which you can check out right here. But if this is the case, I strongly advise working with a registered dietitian to determine the specific triggers and quantities that are an issue for her. I did go dairy free. My daughter had colic and she was just crying a lot. We would do gripe water and that would help a lot too. Gripe water was like a lifesaver. Goat cheeses or goat milks I would occasionally have. I noticed that the weight was flying off being dairy free because there's only so many options you can have. I highly recommend just going dairy free now so that it gets out of your system. Uh, maybe like the last trimester going dairy free. Okay, so if you are unfamiliar with colic, thank the heavens because it's literal hell. Uh, baby E had colic for the first three and a half months and honestly, looking back, I'm not sure how I survived that one. But basically, babies with colic experience intense crying spells for several hours of the day for no apparent reason, AKA a new parent's worst nightmare. We don't exactly know what causes colic as it's likely multifactorial, but for some babies, diet is thought to potentially play a role. However, the research on whether or not a breastfeeding mom needs to go dairy free is admittedly mixed at best. Some research has found that some infants may respond positively to a low allergen or dairy free maternal diet, while other research has found no reduction in the rate of colic when breastfeeding mothers went dairy free. I consulted with my colleague, Chrissy Carroll, who's an expert in this area, and she said that most women can safely enjoy dairy while breastfeeding, and that there is no reason to avoid dairy if you enjoy it, and if your baby is able to tolerate it. In other words, I am against this recommendation to just cut it out of your diet without any evidence that it actually needs to be gone. However, if you suspect that your baby may have a dairy allergy or a cow's milk protein intolerance, it's best to have this confirmed with your pediatrician and to work with a dietitian on an elimination and reintroduction strategy. Alrighty folks, how do things stack up nutritionally for Sam? Overall, I'm not worried about her macros as they all do look pretty much in order and it doesn't sound like she's intentionally restricting any food groups. However, I do wanna flag that we only really saw her have a snack and two meals in this wedding in a day 
So her total caloric intake is sitting at around 900 calories. That is just not enough for a breastfeeding mama like her. I mean, even if she wasn't breastfeeding, this wouldn't be nearly enough calories, even in a caloric deficit for weight loss. So yeah, I'm a wee bit concerned over here about that. Also, because Sam is not getting enough calories to support her own needs, never mind that of her babies, she's consequently also not getting enough fiber. And that to me is kind of ironic considering this is a gut health video. So she's also only meeting around 48% of her calcium needs, which means that her body is going to be pulling from Sam's bone stores to ensure that her baby has enough from her breast milk. Lastly, Sam is getting around 50 grams of protein here, which for a regular non-lactating person would maybe be sufficient in some cases, but breastfeeding mamas would need much more than that. Basically, she's actually deficient in a lot of nutrients, but I'm just mentioning some of these big ones that are a concern for a mom feeding another human being. As for gentle nutrition recommendations, ultimately, I would say there's just not enough food in this day. Depending on how much Sam is nursing, she would likely need an additional 300 to 500 calories per day on top of her usual energy needs. This means that she would need to almost double or triple her calorie intake so that she's getting closer to the 22, 2300 calories per day mark, or even more depending on her activity level. So I would definitely suggest having a solid breakfast in there, which she skipped entirely, and then adding in an extra snack or two throughout the day. Also, I know she mentioned spacing out her meals for good digestion, but it's totally possible to still enable the migratory motor complex while having like a snack or two in there. We really only need between two and three hours between those meals. It doesn't need to be an aggressive five or six. So assuming she's up at the crack of dawn, like most of us moms, hello, 5 a.m. wake up call, uh, there's definitely some time in the day for more eating episodes. I know moms get so busy and it becomes hard to feed ourselves. So that's why I'm just kind of giving her the benefit of the doubt here that that's what's happening and she's not purposefully eating 900 calories and that's it. But we need to prioritize feeding ourselves enough. And that's why in cases like this, I really do urge against things like intermittent fasting because it just whittles down the eating opportunities and it makes it just too difficult for people to meet their nutrient and caloric needs. More specifically, considering that Sam is breastfeeding, we would really want to keep an eye on her fiber, protein, and calcium intake while also significantly bumping up her overall food intake so that she's got enough calories to support her milk supply. I understand society puts a lot of pressure on us women to get our body back after we give birth, but I actually always suggest moms wait until they've fully weaned to take on any intentional weight loss strategies. Your body is still in recovery mode that whole first year, so please give it some grace, patience, and time. Ultimately, we need to start normalizing, appreciating the after body of postpartum life. It's a new body, it is a beautiful body, it's a miraculous superstar body. Like, it grew a freaking human, and for moms like Sam, it's still feeding that human as it grows. Why as moms would we ever want to revert back to what existed before that amazing experience? The afterbody is an amazing thing, so please do keep that top of mind. Finally, when it comes to gut health, besides her probiotic recommendation, I would definitely recommend a more holistic approach by prioritizing sleep, managing stress, exercise, staying hydrated, eating enough fiber, and also being aware of any potential food intolerances and sensitivities. Eating too little can also put your body into a state of stress, which shoots cortisol levels up and can actually negatively impact digestion. So making sure that we are actually nourishing our body and staying well-fed can have a huge beneficial impact as well. Also, cutting out most carbs out of fear that they cause bloating feels unnecessarily restrictive to me. If Sam is experiencing digestive distress from carb-rich meals, I definitely suggest working with a dietitian on a FODMAP elimination trial to determine exactly which foods and how much are causing the issue. Finally, let's chat super briefly about Sam's relationship with food. 
Now I get the impression that Sam's approach to food and eating comes from a place of genuinely wanting to optimize her health, not only for herself, but of course also for the benefit of her baby. She's not fully following any extreme diet or restricting entire food groups or giving up the foods that she loves or enjoys. And aside from a little clean eating rhetoric or the 80-20 or talking about carbs causing her bloating and things like that, I don't see a ton of problematic information, in this video at least. It does seem like she's genuinely trying to find a pattern of eating that feels good to her and is also willing to be somewhat flexible with it, like in the sense that she says she's still gonna have pizza. Now, while she isn't making any major unsubstantiated claims in these videos, I do worry that she may be headed down the wrong path as evidence of her last recent video on intermittent fasting, which we actually just caught wind of literally an hour before I started filming this. So yes, note that I record my videos very far in advance and we didn't catch this until I was literally talking right now. But very quickly, my first major red flag here is that she's getting her information about intermittent fasting protocols from Dr. Axe's podcast featuring Gwenny's BFF, Dr. Will Cole, who is the author of the controversial intuitive fasting book, which I called out in my video right here. So that alone should be cause for concern and probably why Sam considers intermittent fasting to be an intuitive way to reduce calories and speed up the metabolism. I just don't understand that at all. Now I break down the research on intermittent fasting in my video here if you want a full recap, but what I will say is that while intermittent fasting can certainly work for some people and emerging research shows that it may have some additional health benefits, I really do want to caution where Sam is getting her information from. And unfortunately, people like Dr. Axe and Dr. Will Cole cannot be relied upon to provide information rooted in scientific research. So hopefully Sam can reevaluate some of her assumptions around intermittent fasting, as well as food for digestion and weight loss to give herself a better opportunity to meet her nutrient and caloric goals. And that my friends is all that I have for you guys today. If you like this video, be sure to give it the thumbs up. Leave me a comment below on who you'd like to see me review next. Thank you again to Built Bar for sponsoring this video. Do not forget to subscribe and I'll see you next time on Abby's Kitchen. Bye. And for more great videos like this, check out the links right here.